321. This is Radio Days Africa 2021. Audio amplified. Download the Radio Days Africa app. Search Radio Days Africa in your app store. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Johnson. Welcome to Radio Days Africa 2021. It's audio amplified. This is session six and also the 12th edition of the Radio Days Africa and our, sec our second virtual offering due to the COVID pandemic. Radio Days Africa is attempting to stimulate learning, engagement and conversation about radio and the audio business in Africa. That's presented by the Bits Radio Academy. That's Department of Journalism. We have over 70 speakers and about 21 sessions this year, growing ever faster. Uh, by the way, delegates can download the Radio Days Africa app in Google Play and the Apple App Store and just search for Radio Days Africa. All sessions have been podcast and available on the Radio Days Africa website. And we also broadcasting live on YouTube. Radio Days Africa has also commissioned a bespoke podcast series. Please check it out. It's called the podcast, uh, Podcasting the African Way. And it's available at the Radio Days Africa website. You can also WhatsApp us your voice notes if you need to. Country code uh, 0027, uh, 795280000. That's 0027 And please, if you want to add any questions or comments, please just click on the Q&A section on the Zoom feed. Also, we'd like to thank the Conrad Adna Stuchten, the media program in Sub-Saharan Africa. We've been a real long-term partner and sponsor with Radio Days Africa. And without the sponsorship and support and their love of radio, Radio Days Africa would not be possible. Also, I'd like to thank our other supporters, which include the National Association of Broadcasters, Media Heads 360, Wise Buddha Jingles, the US Embassy in Pretoria, RCS Sound Software, our own FM, the South African Music Rights Organization, and podnews.net. Now, I feel like Ronaldo, I just want to take those Coke bottles and put them behind the counter. Today's session is called QBE versus the classroom. When the moderator sent me the information, I thought this was quality basic education, but I was informed that QBE is qualified by experience versus the classroom. And I think it's quite a pertinent subject as a lot of uh, people in radio came in through kind of the side door, the back door, without any formal kind of tertiary education. But nowadays we're seeing a lot more people coming through universities and, and colleges and trying to reconcile these two things within the broadcast area. Our panelists include Grant Nash, uh, Grant's well known for being on air. He started off in community radio, ended up at 5FM and did the great Grant and Anele show. He joined Prime Media as a program manager at uh, 947. He's now the head of creative solutions at Prime Media Broadcasting and also the radio knowledge manager at Boston Media House. So he's got an academic qualification in terms of learning and teaching as well. Also joining us from all the way from Argentina and South America is Alan Findlay. From Wits University, he's a lecturer in journalism and media studies, and also Mzo Georgiana, 702's program manager. You'll see in the blurb it says budget cuts have been <clears throat> have been seen to take many senior staffers out of the business, and uh, the juniorization has been spoken about a lot, and we'll talk about that in in depth today. Uh, also, many senior staff are qualified by experience, while younger practitioners in radio are being trained in media schools and journalism departments. So the question is, is the modern day classroom adequately uh, preparing students with the necessary skills for rigors of working in, in, in broadcasting? So today, basically, we'll be dealing with the human resources part, education, training, and development. And I must say that even before COVID-19 stepped up and waved its ugly head at us, uh, as far back as 2018, 2019, 2020, I know that within major media groups, including the SABC, uh, retrenchments and downsizing were on the table because station revenue targets were lagging anywhere between 25 and 40% behind. And then COVID arrived and made things even worse. So pre-COVID, Mzor, how were you seeing things on the floor? So can you imagine the days before COVID and, and what you were doing? Uh, thanks, Neil. It's, it's so great to be here and be part of this important conversation um, uh, for Radio Days Africa. So I'm delighted that uh, you guys extended an invitation to us. 
Um, you, you're quite right, Neil. I mean, I, I, I think uh, the, the, the conversations around downsizing, uh, imagining or reimagining uh, uh, certainly radio structures and corporate structures, as it were, has been a long conversation and it's becoming uh, for a while. We've been, uh, you know, uh, hearing conversations around, well, traditional media is on the downturn. Um, and, and it's it's on the real uh, on, on the real nil. It's, it's 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 a real thing for us as practitioners on the ground that we have to deal with these things on a day to day basis. I think we're all acutely aware of the challenges that um, that practitioners face. Uh, you know, it started uh, uh, several years ago in the in the print media space, and I think it's rolled on now to possibly traditional broadcast media. But I'm I'm of the view um, that. Uh, you know, certainly the traditional broadcast media is not going anywhere. Radio's alive and kicking well. Uh, do we have challenges? Yes, we do. Uh, do we have restrictions? Absolutely. And I think the onus is 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 uh, on more, is more on us collaborating with um, our broad partners, be it in the academic uh, institutions, our stakeholders in the regulatory space, and certainly the people that make it possible for us to turn our lights on, our commercial partners. So it's, it's really an ongoing conversation. And I think at every turn, uh, you know, you assess where you are. Uh, I think your point about COVID, um, uh, just, just adding that much pressure into how we operate uh, as, as various businesses has just added that much pressure. Uh, uh, I mean, when advertising business at, at, the, at, at its core, um, if people are not retailing and not trading, you know, then, there's a strong argument if you're a marketing manager that um, you certainly reconsider where that spend goes. Uh, but but it's, it's been tough and it's been hard, um, but certainly we're seeing a glimmer of hope and opportunity. Uh, I mean, the pandemic is not gonna be here forever. And, and certainly even before the pandemic, uh, yes, things look a bit bleak, but we know these things, goes, these things go in cycles. Um, and I think we're possibly on, uh, on the cusp of an upward trajectory in terms of uh, opening up the space again, so you know we can trade like we normally did, which then means more opportunity in terms of um, you know expanding your 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 operations on the ground. That means you hire more people, um, and so so we're generally quite optimistic. Certainly from a prime media and and certainly from a seven or two point of view, um, we see this. Uh, and and you, you made a point a little earlier that there's lots of opportunities, even in a downturn, be it a normal recession or compounded with things like COVID and the pandemic, um, there's still opportunity for our lovely medium and for any other medium for that matter, you just have to dig a little bit deeper. And I think collaboration for me is a big part uh, that um, given have a chance, we may come back to a little bit later. Yeah, Grant, you were program manager at 947, which is kind of prime media's cash cow. And uh, 2018, yeah. we had a, like a big downturn in the economy, uh, our, our South African debt was downgraded. The economically, things weren't looking great. Um, you were having not problems then, but obviously you, you were looking at the bottom line. Now that COVID's arrived um, and you're in a different position and, and now interfacing with clients and, and marketers, how difficult is it to get this buy-in in terms of you know, um, making things more exciting? COVID's been a, a big problem in terms of keeping people on the premises doing things remotely. Um, yep. How difficult ha like, has it been, been, been for you? Yeah, I mean, undeniably, Neil. And I, and I think, you know, one of the ways in which I've always tried to look at it, specifically within, within this context right now, is to say to ourselves, we've almost accelerated where our American counterparts are right now. So our American counterparts were experiencing a lot of what we have been experiencing in our industry now. They were experiencing about five, six, seven, even 10 years ago, right? The, you know, the downturn in advertising in a massive way within the American context uh, where they were. And, and we were sort of looking at them um, specifically, I suppose, uh, South Africa, Australia. Uh, we were sort of looking at them, pointing a finger and going, uh, you know, it's tough. Uh, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And I almost feel like this has been the great leveler, right? Um, I think we can now look at, at, at the revenue we're making. You can look at the turnover that we're making. And you can say, okay, cool. We're, we're kind of in the same space. And so what has the American market done uh, what are they continuously trying to do to, to get us to where we need to be, right? And I think we've, we've got to, we have to be innovative. We as a business have to be innovative. 
We have to begin to think about the products that we sell, how we sell them, how do we cross sell them, how do we work them, um, you know, sweat the assets that we do have, and, and you know, sweat the, the human assets that we do have. People are being asked to do things beyond the scope that they were previously. Um, I mean, I, I can't imagine a producer now on a music radio show not being able to, uh, you know, both cut audio, create audio, um, film, you know, be able to cut film, be able to put that on social media. You know, the producers, when, when I was growing up, you know, you could be a content producer. Isn't that fun? You know, you could write some content and that's all you could do. Now you, you don't have that anymore, buddy. You're going to have to, you're going to have to multi-skill and multitask and find a way to do seven different things. Right. Um, I think it's exciting, but, but I, I also do understand the pressure that everybody's been under. You know, uh, we've, we've lost physically and, uh, you know, colleagues along the way um, because of this, right? It has been a terrible time. And I think we just have to, we have to admit that and be okay with that and say it sucked a little bit. But now to Mzor's point, and I love that, it's not going to be here forever. And what we're going to be stuck with is the innovation that we've had to create right now. Yeah, and that's exciting. You know, so what's happened now is a new set of products, a new way of thinking. And now it's our job as radio people to go out there and, and move it forward. You know, so I think out of the dust has come opportunity. I don't want to sound too optimistic about a very terrible situation and, and, and not sensitive about it. You know, I get, I get everything that has happened. We, we've been tremendously effective as an industry and as people. Um, but I think out of the ashes will come the Phoenix. I, I do believe that because I think we are such a powerful and such a beautiful medium. Yeah, look, I, I saw an interview during the first part of COVID from a CEO castigating angry retrenched staff for not building up like a, a savings nest egg for a rainy day. But I think he was actually being interviewed from his holiday home in Kenton on sea. Just to say <laughs> that. Alan in yeah, Argentina, yeah. Um, you deal mainly in, in the print area of journalism and print. And, and print had turned this this corner long before COVID as well. Um, what what were the worst parts of it, seeing seeing it happen in real time where newsrooms were, were being decimated, um, senior journalists, sub-editors, editors, and, and, and was this, re this juniorization a real thing or is it just something people have been banding around? I mean, your question on the juniorization, I, I do agree that I think it needs to be understood more what exactly we mean by that. Um, uh, but certainly in South Africa, and, and I think this is the case across the continent, in, in print at least. I mean, there's declining sales across the continent in Africa on um, of print sales. And, uh, and there does generally, of course, it seem to be younger journalists that are hired at lower rates and the more senior journalists, the sub-editors and so on, um, who are asked to leave and retrenched. I mean, we mustn't forget that the death of SAPA also comes in this wake. And you know, SAPA played a, played a sort of senior fact-checking role um, in the newsroom. So the, the problems we have in the news also is, is structural and at that extent too. Um, on the good side though, if there, are, if there is a juniorization, there are more young black women being employed. Um, and we do see shifts at the senior level uh, in transformation. There are more and more black editors being employed as the editors of print magazines. Um, so, we need to bear that all in mind in the in a more multifaceted context, uh, context. Um, but I mean Grant and Mazo can speak more clearly about the sort of skills and if the juniorization is a, a myth or if it actually is what's going on. Certainly, the research suggests it is. Okay, um, just talking. I mean, Grant has has had a really positive thing, and and so has Mazo, and so have you, which I find encouraging. Um, because I'm, I'm that half empty type of guy, half glass empty. In your study that was released in 2021, you did a macro study, a, a mapping a study called Mapping Journalism Training Centers in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in your introduction, again, you're saying journalism training and education in Sub-Saharan Africa is flourishing. It is offered by universities, colleges, institutes and schools, nonprofit organizations, media councils, regulators, trade unions, state broadcasters, and the commercial media, amongst others. What were the major takeouts? What your top line um, findings that came out of this, this mapping study? Well, I mean, certainly in terms of this conversation, the, the practical training was emphasized by universities. There are universities that do journalism training aren't sort of um, theoretical places of learning, right? I, I mean, some are, of course, but the ones that differentiated themselves 
other practical training, whether in radio, whether in TV, whether in digital services, uh, digital journalism, or a combination of both. But typically, there's a uh, um, uh, they emphasize one or the other. Uh, most, not, well, many, most offered radio training. Many had their own stations where they offered some kind of uh, training. Some were community stations, like uh, from the Ghana Institute of Journalism, that broadcast nationally. And as you know, of course, WITS has got its own radio station. So there is this um, groundwork for practical training to be, to be delivered that can be responsive to the industry needs. I mean, I would, you know, well, the second th re relevant issue here is that in many countries, the commercial media has a strong interest in training, less so it appeared in South Africa. Um, so you've got uh, the nation um, in Kenya, the standard uh, in Kenya, having uh, an, um, internship programs, you know, training programs and partnerships with Aga Khan University to deliver those programs. Um, so that the links between industry and academia are stronger in some countries. You find the same in Uganda um, with academics sitting on media boards and editorial uh, editors giving input into course content at, at Uganda and Christian University. So the, the point made earlier, it, it was Mazo, I think, he talked about a stronger collaboration between the industry and with um, universities. I think that it does happen here. There's research, you know, students go research, um, the conferences, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, journalists work in universities. It, you know, um, Ritz is a good example. Um, but it could be uh, quite more structured and quite uh, uh, that collaboration. It could be a, lo a lot stronger, that collaboration, I feel. And you do see examples of this in Africa. So. And tell me, today's uh, thing is qualified by experience versus, you know, the formal tertiary like education. For someone who hasn't got a tertiary qualification or undergrad degree, a diploma, certificate, what kind of bridging opportunities are there at learning institutions to, to actually go through a process to kind of commoditize your skills and, and get it recognized and accredited? Well, there are systems in, in, uh, in South Africa, including at WITS, of uh, recognition of prior learning. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to have an undergrad degree to go into um, honors to, to get your honors, um, which is a great leaping stone. You, you can get your honors and you can get your masters and so on. Um, so, so in other countries, I'm not so sure to what extent that that's the case, but certainly in South Africa, there are these bridging opportunities um, uh, to, to get your degrees, yeah. Grant, you've been working at the Boston Media Academy for quite a while. And I believe, you know, during the course of that period, you were using materials that were outdated or just weren't relevant anymore. And, and you took a step forward and actually written, wrote a textbook, which is quite a daunting task. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a daunting task, I must tell you. It wasn't the most fun thing I've ever done in my life, um, is, is to try to write a textbook. Yeah, so I think, I think you, know, you framed it quite nicely. Um, I started working with the Boston Media House back in 2007. And we had a lot of manuals. We had a lot of sort of things that were written by other people. And we put those things together. And as we matured as a business as well at, at, at Boston Media House, so we had, to, we had to mature the syllabus. We had to mature the curricula. You know, we had to formalize certain things. And, and we began to mature too. And we started to find exactly to your point, right? There is a lot of the body of knowledge from radio. And I'm going to speak specifically from a radio perspective, not necessarily from a journalism perspective. Um, a lot of it sits outside of Africa, um, and and it's it comes from America, it comes from the states. I mean, I've got a few books here that I really love, but like everybody in radio knows this book, right? Beyond Powerful Radio, Valerie Geller. Also because she's a very good salesperson, but everybody's got this book, right? Um, I've just uh, recently read this one by uh, David Lloyd, How to Make Great Radio. This is good. This is from the UK, right? But when you read these two things, you will see immediately that there is fundamental cultural differences. There's fundamentally different ways of telling stories. There's fundamentally different ways of the way in which we construct our narratives and the way we do radio, you know? And so for me, it was, it, it was about trying to piece these things together into a curriculum, made it, made it really, really difficult. So I'm gonna be Valerie Geller for a moment. And so we did write this uh, myself with someone called Justine Cullinan. It's called Next Level Radio. And my aim was to try to get something which was really South African to use South African voices. Um, I mean, we, we even go so far as in this book to speak about tech within, again, the South African context. Where do you go and buy a desk? You know, who do you order from? How do you do that? You know, what does that look like? Um, what are the roles that our 
our ICASA play, uh, that our BRC play, you know, and, and, and that's, that, that was kind of the, the aim to try to create something like that. And, you know, one of my favorite things about this is it's already outdated, right? So the currency that we now use at BRC and the way in which we measure is fundamentally different, but that's changed in a year. Um, and so what we're going to have to do again is keep on writing editions of this thing to keep up with it. Uh, but Neil, I do, I do want to make a point here. And I want to say that it actually saddens me a little bit that this is one of the only formalized pieces of textbook you can find in the country. Because we have got such incredible knowledge in this country. We have got such incredible people. This should have and must be written by a South African. I, I, want, I want a South African to write how to make great radio. I want to learn from them. You know, talk radio in this country as we've got such incredible people and so little of that body of knowledge has been written down. It's been documented. It's been, it just doesn't exist, right? In the journalism departments, they do exist. I mean, you can find more today on digital media that was born how many years ago, written by South Africans, than you can find radio stuff. You know, that sucks, man. That, 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 that's on us. That's on us as radio people. We need to be writing these things. We need to be documenting these things. We need to be uh, formalizing these things because we have incredible knowledge, but it's sitting here in a bunch of people. And so, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to get out of this is, is we shouldn't have one textbook. We should have seven to choose from. Um, and, and we should be able to say, cool, you know, let's go with that one because that one makes sense for us. And, and I think it's a bit of an indictment on us as radio people in this country, to be honest. Well, I'm, I'm glad you used the word indictment, um, because as long as I've been in radio since like the early 80s, we've made use of American consultants prim primarily, and, and, and more recently, Australian like, consultants. And, and I'm not saying consultants are, are, are bad news. We've got to pay them in US dollars. It's a really expensive thing and pay their flights and accommodation and you know, all the niceties that, that, that go with it. And it kind of worries me that, you, like you're saying, the head full of steam in terms of radio knowledge and the depth and the legacy is, is really not being, being utilized in this. And, 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 and it goes back to an article I read yesterday. In America, the American uh, retirement community, they have a lobby group and they were talking about um, America's graying workforce and ageism could cost the economy billions of dollars. So it's, it's almost like South Africa's got a bit of a problem here because you've got people like myself who are getting older, um, but you have this young uh, head swell coming into the market as well. So you, you've got to balance the like these things up. So I just think, like you're right, there, there are absolute opportunities here with, with many, many people to kind of formalize all this data and, and information into something that's uh, uh, accredited for like for these courses. But uh, speaking of Grant and Mzo, both from Prime Media, uh, Mzo uh, and, and Grant, you both started uh, as, as people being on air and being producers and you were managed by managers and you had to, you had a line manager and they had their line manager. What's it like, Mzo, being a manager now in terms of what you experienced being managed and now you're managing people? <laughs> um, I wanted to crack a joke, but it might not be appropriate. I was going to say it's terrible, awful, actually. But that, <laughs> that, that, that's not, that wouldn't be the essence of, of the actual truth, Neil. Um, I mean, I'm just, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, just also listen to Grant about, and, and I'll come back to your question, but I do want to touch on this knowledge base uh, and how, you know, we need to contribute as South African practitioners into a very unique way of telling stories uh, by South Africans for, for South Africans, you know? Um, and I guess the onus really does uh, uh, rely on certainly us as, 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 as media owners and people who work in the, in the sharp end of the practice of, 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 of the broadcast industry. And I'll move away a little bit from the exclusive area of journalism, even though journalism is a part of it, but it's really about the broadcast space and how just how fast uh, and changing, how, how quickly changes are uh, and into our feet. So, so Grant makes a very crucial point here that I think there is a, some accountability we need to take as practitioners in terms of contributing into that knowledge base. He's absolutely right, we rely, um, and rightly so, by the way, because we've got to look to the people that have done it. So the pioneers, those who've done ahead of us. So we look at the US market, we look at the English market, and by extension, certainly the Australian market where Certainly, um, you know, we're looking at similar 
maybe not the same kind of demographics, but certainly from an appeal and a market uh, targeting point of view, it's more or less the same. Um, and I think uh, uh, we need to take that one on the chain as practitioners that we don't contribute enough into um, that pool uh, that's still learning at, 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 at a tertiary level, university, Boston Media House, whatever the case may be. And, and, and kind of really bring in like a conceptual framework of how media operates and the pressures that are in our spaces. Uh, at 702, we've taken an approach, which certainly I am a product of myself, uh, as to your point, Neil. You know, I started in the trenches, as if, as so, so to speak, produced for pretty much everyone over the past 15 years, give or take, um, grew up into senior structures. Now you're program manager and you're managing people and you're managed yourself at some point. Um, it's not a terribly hard journey because I think, um, you know, the, the unique thing about certainly the format with which we're working as a top format in that um, really the learnings happen on the ground. So, so my, 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 my guilt, I guess, just hearing my colleagues who are more really involved in the theoretical base of the industry we, we love and has served us all well, is that I certainly not feel, I don't feel I've contributed enough in terms of my own knowledge base and, you know, participate in forums like this and perhaps even going back to, 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 to more formal learning structures. Um, it, it, it certainly hasn't been hard for me, Neil, uh, because I guess from an aspirational point of view, growing up in the trenches, you know, you want to aspire to be a leader yourself, uh, but you have a healthy respect of the people that lead you because it's not an easy job and it's a hugely complicated job with under massive pressures. Um, so so it's, it's, it's one that one, until you sit, until you walk, a mile in those shoes, um, you know, you've, all you have is your ambition to carry you. Uh, and then when you get there, you wish actually you'd possibly stayed where you were before. Uh, but that's totally the case within our business, because I think um, we, we, we encourage uh, a, a culture of learning. Um, so we don't stop learning wherever we are. We stop, you know, there's continuous training um, and uh, no amount of university, uh, you know, any, any kind of formal education really sets you up for just the sharp end of it. So what I think we need to be giving back into institutions is just like prepare people for that space. How 702 and how my other radio stations in the competing space, 947, SABC radio stations, I, mean, I think we're all unique in our own little flavors and how we do what we do and the little tricks we do to get what we need to do. Um, but certainly for me, Neil, it's not been, it's not been a terribly hard journey because you know, you work with incredibly amazing people who uh, been in the industry for, for many years. And I think acutely aware that uh, if you don't pass on the baton, uh, our industry suffers. So it's not about the individual. So we tend to approach this as, as an industry. We're giving back to, to radio. We want to see radio um, still at the forefront of, of, of media uh, uh, in, in 100 years to come, in many, many more years. You know, it should update us. And I think that's, that's really... Um, where, where our efforts are and, and we hopefully, you know, with these kind of platforms and forums, we, we can add a little bit. And Joel, before I get to, to, to go on to that question, how did you get into radio? Did you have any formal like qualifications? Did we a community uh, radio? How did you get in? No, absolutely. So I, I, I didn't go via the community route, even though community radio station plays a crucial part uh, in certainly in terms of a 702 strategy, because we also know that you know, uh, we don't get our pool only from universities. Experience is a big part. I mean, there's a big conversation in, 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 in South African discourse about, you know, how are you gonna get experience if you don't actually provide an opportunity for somebody to do some work? And, you know, you look at Mzo who's sitting on the sharp end of a commercial uh, imperative, who doesn't want somebody necessarily anyway, who, who, who's not quite up to it. So, so we also have a responsibility in, in also collaborating with universities, but, Community stations are a big part of, our, of, of opening up their industry, as it were. So my journey, in many ways, actually, has been very linear. You know, went to university, graduated uh, with journalism. Um, I started an internship at Cape Talk all those many years ago, um, uh, which was, for me, my real first taste in a commercial radio environment. Um, my, my formal education absolutely, you know, did, did a great job in preparing me for it. But what it does is just really open the door for me, just to get a foot in the door. The rest, 
you you learn on the job. It's an it's and it's a it's a continuous uh, journey. It never stops. You know the you know with each uh, growth curve you you come across. There's more learnings. There's a little bit more pain. Um, so I'm a big advocate of of of, of somebody uh, uh, of, of on the job training. Uh, in fact, many, many of the people who work with certainly at 702 aren't strictly journal journalism graduates, you know. So these are people from the University of Life um, uh, because, uh, you know, we don't, journalism is a tool to analyze the issues that we face on a daily basis. Uh, but, but, you know, our, our audiences, you know, aren't, aren't journalists. They, they're normal people, they're doctors, they industry leaders, they government communicators, they are professionals, you know, skilled and, you know, uh, or otherwise uh, professionals. So, so what we bring into the mix is a diverse pool of people, you know, obviously journalism is a key part, but the, the big learnings, if you don't have a, a, a media qualification, uh, you learn on the ground. Um, and it's all about just like, how do we maintain the integrity of our offering? And that really is about the format, you know? So our format is a talk radio one, uh, we do news, current affairs, lifestyle, a little bit of music. Um, you know, uh, only us, we, only, only we can teach you about how we do and what, you know, what our intention is with that strategy. Uh, but so, 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 but for me, it was a fairly linear journey, you know, high school, uh, undergrad, uh, on the job training, very big part of, of, of my own journey. And obviously, as you get, as you grow up in any organization, you need to supplement that with other, you know, business qualification there, because where we are, it's not just strictly programming. It's about how do you generate revenue? You know, how do you manage people? You know, all the other soft skills, as it were, and, you know, strategic, um, strategic interventions. Okay, Grant, you went from <clears throat> receiving orders to now giving orders that may seem a bit you know, black and white. I'm sure there's a great yeah. area. What's it been like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, just a, a quick run through the journey. I think I've been one of those really lucky people to have gone through Tux FM. Um, people ask me what degree I have. I tell them I've got a degree from the University of Radio because that's what Tux was for me. It was a University of Radio. I did study something called English, which was, you know, lots of reading. But really what I did was stay up all night to make radio. You know, so I am, I am, first of all, a massive advocate of, and I think we as an industry should support our community stations, not see them as threats, but see them as absolute, um, you know, they're not adversaries. They, they are our best friends because this is where talent comes from and comes through. I was really fortunate then to go through and, and work 947 on air, to move to 5FM on air. Um, and then, as you said, Neil, start this journey behind the scenes, right? And I, and I think one of my approaches, I think from a management perspective, for better or for worse, and I think sometimes for worse, is is an is a real collaboration and an understanding of of the fact that this is an art form as well as a science. And I am, and I will always be very open to it as an art form. And so, so my management style, and, and like I say, I mean, I might not be right in this, but my management style has always approached it like that and allowed people to play in it like that. And my favorite saying when I do speak to people about radio and, and everybody that has ever sort of worked with me would know, I say, we're in the business of show business, friends. And why I say that is because we are, we're in the business of something that is supposed to be flashy and entertaining and fun and in your face and all of those things, right? That, 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 that are, that, that I think come from people that have been on radio, that have had to do that, that have had to use the hard slugs. Um, so from a management perspective, I've always, I've always looked at it like that um, as, as, as the art. And then, and then from a discipline perspective, I do really believe that if you buy into your craft and you buy into what we do and you all buy into it, then you behave. You know, and those who don't buy into it, well, they're, they're going to they're gonna move. And, and I've seen them come and go continuously. And every single time, I think, I wouldn't say every single time, I'd say 80% of the time when people walk away from making radio, being a part of radio, it's because of their ill discipline not because of ours. Uh, it's because they can't handle the fact that there is an element of discipline that has to come with this. You know? And part of, part of why I suppose I love tertiary education so much is because it does allow you both of those things. Tertiary education allows you the discipline and putting in, but it also allows you the freedom of three, four years of your life that you're never going to get the opportunity to do what you're doing at tertiary institution. You're never going to get the opportunity to spend three years reading books, immersing yourself in knowledge, playing. Um, you know, you're never going to get that as an adult. So 
so for me, it's that freedom coupled with, okay, you're going to have to study to pass this thing um, that makes a person coming out of these institutions the kind of person that I do really like to work with. Oh, by the way, a message from Michelle van Vreek saying, Grant could coach many managers out there with a highly intelligent and creative leader. <laughs> um, getting back to Alan Finley in, in Argentina. Alan, when, when we're doing the, these kind of undergrad, postgrad uh, degrees, are, are people taken through the actual structures of the organization, you know, be it pay grades, organograms, how these institutions actually work uh, as opposed to being trained for the actual job that you want to do, are, are, are these departments giving kind of extra, not lessons, but extra modules on, 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 on how the business actually works from a finance point of view, if companies are listed or not listed, uh, you know, uh, your, your rights as an employee, your rights as an independent contractor or a fixed term contractor, how deep in terms of um, the support before the job actually happens is, is part of the learning process or the educational process. I mean, you raise a good point. And I mean, I, have, I don't have a view of all the, a good view of all the different courses offered in South Africa around radio and that. I mean, of course there is the practical component, um, but the extent to which, uh, you know, labor, labor issues and so on in the structure, the structure would be covered, but, but labor issues, I, I don't know much about whether that's, I haven't heard much about that. Um, being covered, but uh, so certainly if there's a gap there, that would be something worthwhile pursuing. I mean, I did want to just sort of respond quickly to um, a couple of points that Grant, that Grant made and then Mazi made, uh, well, Mazi around the importance of community radio. And of course, as we know in South Africa, some of the community radios are attracting larger audiences and some of the previously recognized as strong uh, commercial radio stations. So, so clearly that's an incredibly important training ground, I'm including Campus radios, um, which which Grant was talking about, um, and then the point about uh, curriculum is that, and, and I'm glad Grant uh, raised the issue of culture. You know, the, the culture and construction of narratives in in the South African context. I mean, in the African context, or in his case, South African context, being different to um, the narratives and, and cultures and ways of approaching news um, uh, in Europe or the US, for example is that one thing that did emerge is a lack of training um, radio journalists in indigenous languages. Now, this is a case in Ghana, for example, where, where um, there's a, the community radio there, which works in indigenous languages, is a, is a powerful producer of news and has massive audiences. But uh, often, the example that was given to me is that news readers uh, translate English news in the moment into indigenous languages, which results in all sorts of fact-checking problems and misinterpretations and so on. And the, the point he was making was there isn't curriculum, a, a curriculum that has been developed on the continent for people working in indigenous languages, including in South Africa at most centers. I'm certainly not aware of one. There might be smaller projects in that. And there's a massive gap too in many universities on researching, um, uh, you know, radio in uh, Isizulu, Isiklasa, or, or um, Zulu newspapers and so on, because it's very English-based or, or Afrikaans-based, um, and this is a this is a major gap. So, you know, you have to try to think. Well, what would this curriculum be like? And I think Grant starts to point to something when he talks about construction of narratives and culture. That there is some a lot of exploration that have, can be done there, given that, of course, that we know that the, um, the, the, the indigenous language radio stations are extremely powerful, including their news, uh, their reach for their news programs. Um, Last point is around, yeah, okay, you make the point around the practical uh, the, the labor relations experience and so on um, that, that I can't comment uh, properly on, um, but, but what there is a trend in um, universities uh, in the region is to offer highly thematic specializations to journalists. Um, uh, so you'll get, a, some will start to offer a degree in economics journalism or health journalism or politics journalism. So you can imagine if you do that for three years, um, you'll be extremely strong in that special specialist area. And I think that is one area where you can't necessarily learn on the beat, so to speak, from community radio and so on, you know, um, to become really, because the issues that journalists have to report on, whether radio or any other medium, are becoming incredibly more complicated. Um, and the journalists do need quite like high level understanding of a certain area 
to report competently on that? I think that's highly important. I think um, yesterday when we were chatting in our, in our prep session, I asked you if you knew about the state of the newsroom report that Vitz does every year, and you said, no, I edit it. So it was quite weird. But tell me, doing, doing those reports to, excuse me, I just got the, the domestic catcher. Um, doing those annual reports, what have you seen over the years? I remember reading one report where you actually did a bit of a study about uh, jobs lost in newsrooms, but also you were dealing with, you know, um, networks, gender balance in newsrooms. In fact, the uh, CBJ, the Committee for the Protection of Journalists, we just had cases on the weekend, and in Kandla, uh, we've seen journalists being killed in many parts in many parts of the world. Um, your e-learning thing, and then one of the things you, you brought up as well is this data journalism and trying to get. Um, we're working in a digital space as well, but there are very few journalists or, or reporters who want to get involved in that data journalism. So those state of the newsroom, like reports may, you know, year to year change. What have you seen over the quantum period that you've been editing that particular journal? Well, I mean, at the, at the, at the practical level, we have over, over time, see, of course, seen the retrenchments and the downsizing of the newsrooms. Um, it's very hard to measure that accurately for various reasons is not all media houses report uh, their retrenchments properly or they mix them in with kind of um, uh, manage office managers or admin people when retrenchments happen and um, so it's sometimes not it's difficult to say well how many are journalists right <clears throat> but if you construct the picture there's a clear downward swing and the, the, the most recent you know the, a few years ago, it was well half of the ten thousand that were employed employed a decade ago. Journalists employed are only employed now. That leaves five thousand, and if you add them up, and someone recently apparently did a, 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 a count, the head count effectively, and came up with a figure of one and a half thousand journalists right now. So it's hard for me to sort of wrap my head around: is that realistic or not realistic? You know, the professional full-time journalist, but that's what what the, the figure people are saying. And as I say, but you do have this transformation going on. And in fact, the, 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 the recent stats are that in terms of gender, there's in terms of the editors of newspapers now, um, the, the broadcast is very difficult to count because who's a journalist, who's not a journalist, right? That's one of the problems too. But it's so, so in terms of uh, newspapers, about 30% are female in editors and 67% male. So there's some work that needs to be done there. About 51% are black and uh, 23% uh, white, and there's also a colored and Indian category. Um, board, the boards, which is also an important indicator, is um, it's only about 24% female and 68% male. This is a major media houses surveyed. 35% um, black. So there's lower, there's lower um, uh, transformation in the, in the, at the board level. But at the senior and um, editor level and at the, the staff level, there's, there's, quite a, there's quite a big change in terms of uh, the transformation in terms of race, which might or might not affect the content output and so on. So, so there, is, there are changes there. There are, of course, all these fin the financial pressures that we've uh, Grant and Mazur and yourself were speaking about that, that newsrooms are facing and a very big, um, big, well, you know, there's a strong and, uh, undercurrent of funded news. Um, yeah. You know, so you have your uh, Amo Bungani, the ground up, and Becky Sisa, which, um, in my opinion, is a very healthy and important part of, of the media mix um, that, that, that we need to think about. I think that's an important thing because I know in, in the United States there, and in, and in, and in Scandinavia, in, in Sweden and, and Norway, uh, there's been a lot of work put, being put put into this non-profit news organization stuff. And, 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 and I'm, I'm not saying they're hugely successful, but they're managing to keep people employed, still do investigative journalism, still do beat journalism, and, and, and do the job that journalists and reporters do. Yeah, I mean, that's right. Is it, and I mean, we've seen the results of some of this funded journalism coming out from the, from the likes of Amal Bungani and, and Ground Up, which I, in my opinion, Ground Up is doing an excellent job um, uh, in, in producing news. Um, uh, the, 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 some people say, well, you know, then you get donor tie, tie, tied in and donors direct your uh, news agenda and so on. And sometimes this may be true. I mean, the, the fact is there are many donors who deliberately recognize that as a problem and take a hands-off approach. And a lot of it is about um, 
the, the, the negotiation strength and the insistence of the organization being funded. And, and I think uh, Amr Mungani has a piece somewhere around how they approach that. So then the independence becomes a question of um, uh, negotiation with donors around what, to, what can, the money can be used for, which is a whole different category, but it's a healthy one to be engaged with. I mean, I don't, I mean, certainly in the, the media freedoms and internet rights space, there are lots of very open-minded donors who, who have who are, the last thing they want to do is to control an organization's editorial output. Um, so I think it's a healthy, a healthy development. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you spoke about was um, the over emphasis on, on, on digital news and your, your, your feelings and opinions on that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a personal feeling rather than a institutional feeling. I mean, I certainly know that's, uh, which is now, of course, uh, you're probably know, becoming a center that, that they're placing a strong emphasis on digital news and there's great need for digital news training and, and you know, data journalism and so on across the continent, including in South Africa. Um, from my side, I, I do think that, that, that the, there's a danger of overemphasizing that because we still see that, for example, radio being placed in point, how powerful and strong it is. Um, and, uh, you know, that's aside from whether you can broadcast on internet and all that kind of stuff, just practical radio is still got the audience and got the reach. And, and I think there's, there's obviously a danger if we try, uh, let the technology determine the future of news, if that makes sense. You know. There's a question here from Ayanda Mgede. It says, is there a disconnect with the new blood coming from student newsrooms and the very few senior staff members still left in our newsrooms? All of this considering the disintegration of traditional media. And I think that's got a lot to do with your people's perceptions of, of, of what the structure is. But Alan, have you seen structures in newsrooms change? What new jobs, what new positions? Have people been creative? I know that a, a lot of journalists used to write for one publication. Now they're writing for multiple publications within the group. Um, just to answer that question, is the traditional newsroom disintegrating and, and, and or what new structures or things have they, have they put into place to compensate? I mean, I feel Grant and Mazo would be able to answer that much, much better than I could. I mean, but, but, but you know, they already mentioned the multimedia skills needed by um, a younger journalists, which many older journalists aren't really trained for that. I mean, the thing, the thing is that we need to start thinking of news as the, people talk about the, the industry model of journalism is no longer here. In other words, many people can produce news now in different ways. And, and they were speaking about uh, innovation earlier. The, the, with COVID, the fact that now we take Zoom meetings and webinars almost as part of our lives, which we didn't to this extent before, creates opportunities for people, everyday people to start creating um, their own little media processes. I mean, running a webinar, it's, it's almost like broadcasting and it's, it's free, you know? And this can allow, and you see people creating podcasts and all over the internet, for example, and I've just spoken about digital news on a, in a more negative way, but there are opportunities that, um, that allow more uh, um, non-professional organizations producing news. So you're seeing a proliferation of that and we need to keep that in the whole idea of how the media works. Yeah. Grant, before I get to you, just, just on the point that Alan's making, so I'd like to know the thinking behind what's happened. You guys are running some programming late at night that comes from outside the station, uh, from, I don't know if it's Voice of America or Deutsche Welle or Radio France International or BBC, but I'm seeing this a lot, not just only on radio, but on television, where um, it's almost, I, I, I get the feeling that you've got to fill a gap or you've got to save some money. So you're going to take this feed from an outside broadcaster. And I know having dealt with them in the past, you can't really edit their stuff. You either use it in the way they give it to you. Do, do you think this compromises your programming at all? Um, so, so Neil, I mean, I think you, uh, I'm delighted to let you know that we don't outsource any of our programming to anyone else. Uh, be it outside the realms of high media and most certainly international. Um, um, but I, I, I think your observation and certainly in contributing into the broader conversation, um, yes, so certainly uh, over the past recent times, we've had to obviously relook at our programming, particularly in the evenings. And it will always be that question of assessing uh, return on effort, you know. Uh, 
So it's, it's you know, what, what do we do on, on, on late night programming? Uh, you know, best of the, the opportunity for us and certainly the opportunity costs uh, if, if one can go there. But one of the things we, we realized, and this is our approach uh, in moving forward, um, that uh, to, 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 to contribute really to this other conversation, we want to create an opportunity to be training young people uh, and, and actually not necessarily even young people, I guess newcomers into this very unique platform and this talk format uh, in, 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 in South Africa. So, so, so we, you know, over the many years I've been uh, at Prime Media, we've, 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 we've tended to use that uh, late night, overnight uh, time channels as a training ground um, to, to give uh, younger and certainly uh, ex to expose, you know, aspirant talk radio presenters, uh, producers, technical producers, et cetera, et cetera. So we feel that that is a, a, a fatal training ground for us. And we, ce we certainly uh, well intent on reinstituting that and, uh, and make it a, a key strategic lever um, for Prime Media and certainly 702 to have a place where we can, you know, uh, uh, train and, and and get people comfortable in the format, because, you know, it's certainly our view uh, and my view that uh, there's a lot of value you can learn in a theoretical sense uh, and some technical understanding of the industry, but until you touch it and you're there on the ground on a core place of it, um, and it, it'll be different for every business. So, so I, I certainly think we're putting our hands up at 702, saying we realize that. There's an opportunity, there's a gap actually in that training, uh, the next breed of Bongani, the next breed of John Perlman, Clement, et cetera, et cetera. And we can't, we can't only rely on and our, our partners from a community-based and certainly from an academic uh, perspective. So we've got to actually do that ourselves. Um, so, so, so that's been a key uh, strategic intention for us going into the new year and beyond that we need to uh, go back into opening up that space and bringing people to you know, we, we've got to look, we've got to think 10 years from now, and that's how we certainly uh, future proof our, our industry. Certainly, that's our contribution. And then there's many other things we're doing, obviously, in that space, but that's certainly a key part for us as, as, from a 702 point of view. So, Grant, earlier you spoke about the skill set, and I mean, I must agree with you 1000% is when someone walks through the door, They've got to be able to curate content, they've got to be able to do video and audio, and they've got to be able to do the social media and the back end of the website, um, yeah. plus other stuff we want them to do. I mean, how difficult is it to find these types of skill sets in one person? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult. And I think it's, it's something which I would be lying if I sat in front of you and said to you that we've got, you know, a thousand graduates that are standing outside our door going, you know, we can do this job. And it's, it's, it's twofold, I think. Part of the reason is because it moves so quickly. And so the people that are working with it every day have had to adapt really quickly to that. And second of all, it is also our job as members of the tertiary institutions around the, uh, around the country to begin to find a way to close that gap. And Alan spoke about it a little bit. I think that there are incredible examples of that in Africa where the commercial players have closed the gap to their tertiary institutions and they rely on their tertiary institutions to get them good graduates that they can use. And I don't always think that we as South Africa per se have looked at it like that. You know, um, I'm going to give you a, an example, Neil, and I actually feel quite bad saying this because it's not always the case, but having been in the tertiary space for a long time, you know how often we invite a guest speaker to come in, right? And all this guest speaker does is speak about themselves. And as much as that contributes to the being of a student, what about the knowing and what about the doing? What are you leaving that student with? First of all, it's very difficult to get them to come to speak to our students. And second of all, they literally come and tell us how great they are. And I've seen this over and over and over again, right? If, if, if you are not in the industry um, and you are not concerned about the next wave of people, ask yourself why, and then ask yourself how you're contributing to them and maybe it is being a guest lecturer for a day, but then do me a favor when you do come, like have real knowings and doings that you can leave these young people with, you know, um, you know, real tangible things. I, I will never forget, I watched, um, it was for Discovery where Wade van Niekerk uh, was doing a session with young athletes and it was really PR, right? He was, he was there to do PR, let's be honest. But I remember him helping them hook up their 
what do they call starting blocks. And there he was. These are young, really good athletes, but they've got an Olympian helping them set up their starting blocks. And I thought to myself, this man, th this is incredible, right? He didn't come and talk about himself. He didn't come and talk about how great he was and how fast he runs. He came and he gave that real knowing and doing knowledge to these young people. And every single one of those young athletes were richer because of it. And I see it all the time. We invite program managers. We invite newsroom people. We invite people into the classrooms. And they spend 45 minutes talking about themselves and, and taking selfies afterwards. We, we invite presenters to come. And presenters, again, want to use this as an opportunity to, I don't know, you know, enrich themselves. I think the job is to enrich the young people. The job is to enrich the people that are sitting in front of you and to give them five things, six things that they can come out richer because of it, you know? So you can hear that I, I have, I'm, I'm very opinionated on it because I don't think we do enough for young people and I think we make it about ourselves, you know? I think it's our job as people that have been in this industry um, to, to really focus on trying to close that gap so that w when, we, w when we are, you know, and then, sorry, just as a side, I also want to say not enough emphasis is, is placed on the commercial part of the business either, Neil. A lot of what we're speaking about today is programming stuff. It's creating the product, right? But the reality is that there's a whole other business here. And that part of the business is actually is, is probably, you know, more emphasized within the commercial space. And our content creators don't necessarily work on that space and work enough in that space. And so what I'd also say is it's the job of Vega School of Advertising. It's the job of AAA School of Advertising. It's the job of all of that to, to we're a billion, rand, we, we're billions of rands or dollars of business up in Africa. Don't ignore us. You know, get your graduates to, you've got up the Yazoo in digital things that these students can do. How many of them are learning how to strategize in radio? Um, how to come up with radio concepts, how to sell these radio concepts, how to plan on radio. You know, you're just ignoring this. You're ignoring, but we're a billion rand business. It, one of us is a billion rand business in this country. Trust me, there's huge revenue that is being rolled through radio across the continent and you're ignoring us. And I think it's our job as radio to go to these schools and say, let's teach you how to, how to construct radio, how to use radio effectively. You know, but, it's our but, job but to do I that and we've got to close that gap. But I also do think, you know, it's a responsibility of, of managers, ex-co's, man-co's to explain this stuff. And it's not just the induction process when a person gets into the company. You know, it's, I, I've worked at stations where when you do a staff meeting, the financials go up on the wall. This was the target. We made this much. This is how much we paid SARS this month. This is how much we're behind target or above target. This is how much we spent on operations. You know, so and then that sparks a, a kind of thinking process among staff who really don't know how it works. When you talk about the commercial aspect, like I really believe that everyone in sales, marketing, whatever, should think like a program manager and a sales manager. I mean, these concepts and content linking to potential sponsorship, etc. So you're right, people are left in these isolated I hate using the word silos, but to, to get them to have a bigger understanding of the business we're in, A, serving the audiences, creating opportunities for advertisers is like highly important. We're running out of time. I just want to, I just want to ask you, Grant, and, and Zorb, before we go, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real push, and, and I get it all the time from people that are trying to get into radio saying that it's like, it's like the ANC, you know, they're gatekeepers. We're gatekeeping. We're trying to keep this to be an yeah. exclusive club. What's your short answer to that? No, Neil. Uh, if My I short answer is absolutely not. So you go first. Okay. 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 Go so uh, I mean, I like you, Grant. It's it's absolutely not the case, uh, Neil. In fact, uh, if nothing could be, uh, is, is the opposite is probably true. In that we are almost desperate. I mean, Grant was making a point a little earlier that. You know, you try find somebody who's uh, fit for purpose in a commercial uh, environment in terms of conception, delivery, understanding uh, our client needs. Um, I mean, there's people, like you said, they're just not lining up outside the building. So, so if, if anything, it's, it's the opposite. Uh, what we've possibly faced with is just the challenge of, I think, hence we're having this conversation. Um, just given the pressures to deliver what we need to do, you know, in a perfect world, somebody would come in, they're good to go, but they're not. And I think uh, there's, there's been, for me, what I'm taking away from this conversation, a big challenge to us as practitioners and media owners 
to really get involved in the sharp end of the uh, theoretical academic uh, framework to really make a meaningful contribution there so that when these kids and these young guys come out of university, they have a sense also, am I going to be a producer? Am I going to be a presenter? Or actually, hey, I could be a salesperson. It's still in radio because it all matters. Uh, I could be a creative uh, strategist, uh, uh, you know, in grants team. Um, so, so I think really there, there, there's a great need for, for us who practice these things on a daily basis. I mean, it comes second nature after a while. But we're not, I'm not convinced that we're contributing a lot more into that knowledge base uh, so that these kids have a sense as well. So they don't fumble. So they don't start in programming when actually their passion and their own abilities might be elsewhere still within the broadcast space. Well, look, there's a, there's a lot we haven't spoken about today. I mean, about how people are employed, being a staff member, being an independent contractor, a fixed term contractor, um, and, and also the legal things around the basic conditions of Employment Act, you know, the Labor Relations Act, we spoke about the BE codes and em employment equity and gender equity. So I think that there's, there's a whole another session to be had around this, but I'd really like to thank our panelists today. Sorry we couldn't ask answer all, like all your questions. I'd like to thank uh, our panelists, which included Grant Nash from Prime Media, um, Zor from uh, 702, and Alan Finley from uh, the BITS uh, Journalism, Sc School of Journalism. I'd also like to thank the Conrad Adnar Stichten and the Sub-Sahara African Media Program. I'd also like to thank our supporters, which are the National Association of Broadcasters, Media Heads 360, Wise Buddha Jingles, the U.S. Embassy in Pretoria, RCS Sound Software, Iono, Samra, and Podnews.net. Please join us tomorrow morning for day four, uh, the 8th of uh, July, Thursday. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, uh, John Savage will be talking Podcasting 101, the masterclass. He'll be telling you how to get a, a podcast done, how to monetize it, and market it. And at 2 o'clock uh, tomorrow afternoon, the second session for Radio Days Africa, um, will be hosted by Jonathan Limington, otherwise known as King James, based in Nigeria. And his contributors will be Asetu Bailey Wele from Adu Radio in Ethiopia, Jacob Nchengazi from Brits Radio Academy, he's the head of the Radio Academy, as well as Mick Piri from BBC Media Action in Zambia. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. See you tomorrow. Thank you for joining this Radio Days Africa audio amplified session. For highlights, podcasts, and more, visit radiodaysafrica.co.za.